going on? What's going on? Is there people, is there people here this morning? Ourselves 
and to a posture of lament, even as the sun comes through the windows this morning. Welcome to worship.
God, this is wilderness time. When every path is obscure and thorns have grown around the words of hope. In this time of wilderness waiting, it is a time of stone, not bread. And even the sunrise feels uncertain. And everything tastes of bitterness. This is the time of ashes and dust, when the darkness clothes our dreams and no star shines a guiding light. It is the time of treading life, waiting for the swells to subside and for the chaos to clear. Be the wings of our strength, O oh God, in this time of wilderness waiting. Amen. Good morning again. Nice to see you. Hi back there. Look who it is. Hi. Good morning, Bright Eyes. Hi. It's good to see each and every one of you, although some are a little cuter to see. I mean, really. You gotta admit. Uh, nice to see you all. Let me just um, share with you a couple of things. One is, um, I, well, I don't think it's on the next slide, but there will be a slide up here when we get close to the offering. I've had some people ask about how they could give um, and contribute to the efforts in the Ukraine. So just so you know how the United Methodist Church works. So every local church, we give a tithe and offering. We call those apportionments that go to the global denomination. And when we do that, we support... Um, something called Global Ministries um, Committee on Relief, so that there are mission and ministries happening all over the world. So the United Methodist Church, which is active in the Ukraine, the Bishop of the Ukraine is also the Bishop of Russia. Can you imagine? Yeah, prayers for him. So the United Methodists are already on the ground in the Ukraine and surrounding areas providing relief. We, because of our apportionments, we support those missions and ministries. So if you desire to give money to support those relief efforts there, 100% of your dollars go to the relief effort. Because our apportionment giving, our tithes and offerings have already paid for administration and, and all of the other kind of overhead that needs to happen for those ministries to happen. So um, there'll be a link to how you can write a check. If you want to write a check and just put on there Ukraine, we'll make sure that those go to Global Ministries. Um, you can also go on, um, I'll, I'll make sure to put it on our website and put it in social media, the links that you can give directly online as well, okay? Second and fourth Thursdays of the month, we continue to collect sandwiches for Roof Above. You can bring those between 10 and 10.30. The 12th this coming weekend, we'll be hosting Room in the Inn again, so um, keep that in your prayers. Or if you'd like to help volunteer with setting up, let Julie know. And um, I can also connect you directly to Julie, too, and she'll put you to work, I'm sure. Um, we're going to be wrapping up Room in the Inn pretty soon um, with winter months, hopefully are drawing to an end because I'm enjoying the sunshine. But there'll be other ways for us to help out to our brothers and sisters who um, are without homes, um, permanent housing. Um, so stay tuned for that. Am I forgetting any announcements? Think of anything else. Okay. So I'm going to invite you to stand, greet one another, say hello. You can do that in a way that's most comfortable for you. If you want to do it as a wave, that works too. Um, I will remind you that the baby back here is not vaccinated, so um, I think waves might be great. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we, we want to remember those that are still very vulnerable during this time. So say hello to each other.
On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me. They open wide their mouths at me like a roaring lion. My mouth is dried up. My tongue sticks to my jaws. I am laid in the dust of death. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. Oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. They are hard words to pray, O oh God, and they are words of deep faith and words of honesty and courage. And we know that you give honor to our honesty. So come and be near us in our pain and in our grief. And we will move from lament and groans and tears to shouts of Alleluia on Easter Day. For we pray in the name of your Son who cried, who cried out, and who understood lament. And we join now our many voices together with the voices who have gone on before us so that we do not pray alone. And we pray the prayer Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Before we stand and sing our doxology as a way of giving thanks for all of the many gifts and blessings, I just um, want to, there's the information if you want to um, help give towards the efforts in the Ukraine. Um, I want to thank you for your continued support and your faithfulness and your giving to the Vine United Methodist Church. And so, in praise and thanksgiving and in dedication of our gifts, I invite you to stand and let us join together in our God call.
Look at me. Answer me, Lord my God. Restore sight to my eyes. Otherwise, I'll sleep the sleep of death, and my enemy will say I won. My foes will rejoice over my downfall. But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. Yes, I will sing to the Lord, because he has been good to me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have to confess, as somebody who's been doing church work for 21 years, uh, we don't often give space for lament in church. Um, we give Good Friday a good try, but even over the last 21 years, the um, amount of people who participate in Good Friday is pretty low. And I'll say this because my dad's not here right now, but my dad uh, used to always say growing up, we would do Monday Thursday and a Good Friday, and he would, he would always say, oh, that Good Friday service, it's just... It's just so dark and so sad. And I was like, that's kind of the point, Dad. But he always dreaded it because it's this, you know, somber. And really, those hymns might be about the only really good, dark, lamenting hymns that we get on Good Friday. And they are particular for the crucifixion, the experience of Jesus' last time, last hours on earth. And yet... Lament is all in Scripture. So why don't we as a church give a space for people to lament? We hit a place of despair and our first reaction is to get out of it as soon as possible, isn't it? And when somebody else comes to us with despair, we, we, we look for words or try to do something, give them something that they can hold on to. So we quote Scripture or... We do what I call bumper sticker theology. We give somebody a good one-liner that tries to wrap up their mess nice and neat so the bad goes away. And we often will compare ourselves with others, thinking that their life looks good. But really, we start to go into this place of toxic positivity, dismissing pain, instead of paying attention to it and giving it honor. Because sometimes saying to another person everything is going to be all right is more damaging than it is good. Lament is faith. It is pure. It is honest. And it is an expression of our faith and our devotion to God, and it is biblical. That's why we often turn to the Psalms to help us process our feelings. And Walter Brueggemann, who is a theologian, a writer, who turns out more books than anybody I know, he gives us an understanding of the Psalms. He says the, the Psalms help show us this, this journey that we are on, this, this stage, which goes from orientation to disorientation to new orientation. And the Psalms give us permission to be in a relationship with God on whichever level, orientation, disorientation, or new orientation, we find ourselves. So, for example, the Psalms of Orientation, they articulate the goodness, the reliability of God's creation and law. Like in Psalm 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, what is humankind that you are mindful of them? It is a psalm of certainty. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then there are psalms of disorientation which convey seasons of hurt or 
alienation or suffering and death, they evoke rage, resentment, hatred, self-pity even. Like Psalm 13, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And then finally, there are psalms of new orientation that share the gifts that God gives in surprising ways. Joy breaks through the despair. Light dispels the darkness. Like Psalm 30, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. I called for your help, and you helped me. You brought me up from the realm of the dead. Sing praise to the Lord, for the Lord's anger lasts only a moment. Now we travel in and out of orientation, disorientation, and new orientation, sometimes in no particular order. We don't have to be in one space for a long period of time. We, we can experience it within a day of knowing and certain and feeling that way, and a phone call later, find ourselves in a place of disorientation and despair. And what the psalmist tells us is that God is in each of those moments. And the point isn't necessarily to hurry up and get to new orientation. The faith is to be present and aware of God with us, even in the disorientation. And notice the moving in and out. We also see this pattern of orientation, disorientation, new orientation in the Bible, in the people, in the Exodus story, going from slavery, what was known, to being led out and wandering for years and feeling disoriented, feeling like all they knew was gone, and then finally settling into promised land. Two years ago, we were all feeling good, weren't we? Yeah. Two years ago, we were rocking and rolling. I mean, especially with this church, we were rocking and rolling. Life was good for a lot of us, wasn't it, two years ago? And even if it was bad, at least the bad was known, right? <laughs> at least our bad stuff, we could deal with it, and we were aware of it, and we were sure of the bad stuff. But the past two years have been disorienting and uncertain, and we want to go back to the way it was. Even if the way it was, in hindsight, was slavery. And we cry out, wanting a new orientation. And we're not there yet. We are still in disorientation. We are grieving what we have lost. We want stabilization. And it's been two years. It hasn't even been 40. As a clergy friend reminded me, Maybe we need 40. And I thought, oh, Lord, not 40. But notice that in that time of wilderness, God doesn't rush the people on to get them to the happy place. God doesn't make it all go away. Instead, that time of disorientation becomes an opportunity of letting go of the past, releasing so that there's more dependence on God and strength for the time ahead. Maybe God was using the disorientation time to form the people as God's chosen. And God gives you and me the Psalms as a way to cry out. To know that our disorientation that we're in right now, it is not the first. Others have cried out before us. Brueggemann talks about how odd and concerning it is that Christians, liturgy, hymns, they don't include lament because we always want to turn to hallelujahs and God is good and everything will be okay. 
And he writes, the reason for such relentless affirmation of orientation seems to come not from faith, but from wishful optimism of our culture. An odd inclination for passionate Bible users, given the large number of psalms that are psalms of lament, protest, and complaint about the incoherence that is experienced in the world. To lament is to be a person of deep faith. It is to bring our whole selves to God. It is a form of praise. It is a proof of being in relationship. Dr. Russell Moore in his book, Adopted for Life, describes going to an orphanage. And as they were in the process of pursuing an adoption in all places of Russia, and when they went to this orphanage, the silence from the nursery, he says, was eerie. The babies in the cribs never cried, not because they never needed anything, but because they learned that no one cared enough to answer. Children who are confident of the love of a caregiver cry. For the Christian, our lament, when taken to our God in heaven, is proof of our relationship with God, our connection to the great caregiver. Lament is a pathway to being intimate with God. Just think about the times that you have been honest, truly honest with someone. It created this space of deep intimacy and trust. It is a prayer and an invitation for God to act in your life. And it is a participation in the pain of others. Solidarity. We can lament when others are hurting. We can lament over our earth groaning. And lament is not our final prayer. It is a prayer that will move us to a prayer of orientation, of new orientation to Easter. But if today you are not there, if you are feeling disoriented, then be of good faith and lament. Cry out. Call out. Get angry. Feel. Be enraged for yourself, for, for the world. Don't be in too quick of a hurry to rush to feeling better. Know that your expression of lament is a faithful one. And in the next few weeks, we are going to learn more about laments and the stages of lament, and you're going to have an opportunity at the end to write your own lament. But lament is a form of praise. It is an expression of true honesty. Hear these words from Romans, not from a psalm, but from Romans. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly, as we wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? We wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. And the Spirit who searches our hearts knows the mind because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. How long, O oh God, will you forgive us? I invite you to help consider and think about and share places of orientation. What, what can you claim and say, this I know is sure and certain. And, and if it's that way today and it happens to not be that way tomorrow, that's okay. 
The psalmists talk about that too. But but is there something for you for you that is sure and certain that is your place of orientation? The outside group talked about creation being outside. Anybody feel that way when they go outside? I, I feel that way. Laura, I know, feels that way. When I go outside, I feel a sense of connection and groundedness and certainty. Um, and, and a beauty in knowing that I'm a very small part of something much bigger. I always remember the verse of my mother taught me that God's the same today as he was yesterday and he will be tomorrow. The consistency of who God is, that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And 
and we talked in the morning group how, how many of you have ever experienced a deep loss, maybe a death in the family or experienced a deep loss, and somebody with really loving good intentions says to you, oh, everything's going to be okay. Or, um, well, that person needed to die because God needed another rose in the garden in heaven. That is just not helpful, right? Loving, maybe, but dismisses your pain. And as I told the kids this morning, um, Jesus cried. And Jesus experienced pain. And Jesus lamented. And um, it, it was not up to, to God to rush through that, or Jesus to rush through that, but to stand faithfully in that. And, it, and use that as an expression of praise and an offering to God. So I leave you with the psalmist's words again. How long will you forget me, Lord, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. I will sing even songs of lament to the Lord because God has been good to me. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn. It's called Beams of Heaven as I Go. Lord, will you come up here? This one's a little tricky, but you got to find, like, we can't just stand up and start singing Joy to the World after talking about the men, right? So, um, Laura, thankfully, is going to help us um, sing this, so let's stand together and sing.
And if you go on a stage in a space of lament, go knowing that God is there with you, crying, holding, loving you in that space. And God's grace and peace. Amen.